Okay, that's it. We're live. Um, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to Farnborough College. Welcome to the students from uh, Eastleigh College as well. Um, so as I explained earlier, today is all about celebrating hospitality as an amazing career choice. Well, I fall off my chair. Um, huge round of applause to the panel. In no particular order, other than the order I've got them on here, we've got Tom de Kaiser. So Tom... Very briefly, Tom grew up in Essex. Um, he's now very fortunate. He's working for Tom Kerridge at the coach in Marlow. If you ever get the opportunity to go in the coach, it's a fantastic, amazing uh, career opportunity and also a fantastic dining experience. Directly to my right is Sabrina Gidder. Um, Sabrina never wanted to become a chef, so I'm sure she can tell us how she fell into that. Um, Sabrina's now the, uh, she became the head chef in London Marlow Bones um, in 2015. Uh, with her love of Italian food. And finally, in September last year, Sabrina was asked to become the executive chef of Albright. Um, so we'll be talking to Sabrina a little bit about that. Um, handsome Alex, as he's affectionately known. Uh, Alex Payne. Um, many of you would have seen Alex on MasterChef, the professional. Alex is now the sous chef at the Vineyard. And last, but by no means least, we've got Matt Pickup. Uh, Matt works for uh, Gate Gourmet. He's originally from the West Country. Had an amazing career. Worked with chefs such as Gordon Ramsay. Worked at Claridge's. Um, now does literally millions and millions of meals a year. Um, if any of you have ever flown on an airline, it was probably cooked by Matt and his team. Okay, so without further ado then, um, the first question. What's been the best bit of careers advice you've ever been given? Sabrina, I think you said that that was work hard, work smart and always be polite. Yeah, I think, um, I'm, I mean, I, I wasn't... My entire sort of uh, education was in, in sort of what we normally know as school. So it was A-levels followed by university. And I never, never went to catering college, uh, which is why it's such a privilege to be here today, actually. Um, and yeah, I think, I think they are kind of cornerstones, really, is work, always work hard because it, it gives you the ethic that you need moving forward. Work smart because sometimes people will tell you that you can't do things. And actually, do you know what? If you can, then just do it. Um, and always be polite because people remember that most of the time. So the effing and blinding is fine on occasion, uh, but actually your manners are the things that people will most remember you for, really. So, uh, Alex, um, when you were at the Savoy, you were told, you know, don't jump too quickly into roles. I mean, do you think that's something that chefs are doing and, and chefs need to sort of stabilise and spend a certain amount of time in a role? What was the advice you, you were given there? Yeah, exactly. When I was at the Savoy, I was told when I was leaving, it's, I got told to stay at a chef to party level for as long as you can because you'll be cooking at that level for as long as you can. You kind of establish what you want to do, how you, like what sort of food you want to cook um, later on in your career, if you want to go into pastry, if you want to learn you know, fine dining food, more relaxed food. Um, so it's a lot of, you know, people do move very quickly up the, career, up the ladder in the uh, career. So it's learning to cook is the most important thing. And it's kind of, you know, putting those more feathers to your tail and all that. Um, so learning as much as you can while you're young is the most important bit of advice I ever got told. No, it's really important. Um, Matt, you said that um, when you were with Gordon, a piece of advice he gave you was, you know, you can measure how, how good you are, how good your business is by how it runs when you're not there. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we've got to remember, I'm the veteran, by the way, of the industry here. So, uh, you know, we've got to remember no, the, the hours <laughs> that you do. Um, it, it's really key to understand that, you know, you, you're constantly working in, in, in a very high tense environment um, and, and, and understanding that all of the things that are around you uh, and training is really key because what we learned was if you're in the restaurant 24 hours a day, seven days a week and you never get a break, you're really no good to anybody when you're dead. So you know, ultimately uh, it's about really pushing teams to work clever and, and then as Sabrina said, it's about working clever but also clever chefs don't always have to be there because it's the way your kitchen runs when you're not there that's how you understand how somebody runs their kitchen so it's really key and tom uh yours you know very very good work hard and everything else will come yeah massively yeah exactly what Sabrina said really but let's just concentrate on just being slightly better making things slightly nicer than you did the day before and then just everything else is yeah it'll just come to you always find the right person to work for that's 
the hardest part of it. If you're working hard for the wrong person, it's game over. No point. You might as well not do it. So make sure you enjoy it and yeah, every day a little bit better. I don't think there is any substitute for hard work. As if you take someone like David Beckham, he didn't become the best crosser of the ball overnight. It's because he spent hours and hours on a field kicking a football. So you know, I think whatever career you're in, you're going to be you know be prepared to work very hard. Okay, um, what would be the best bit of advice you would give to the students here today who are obviously going to be embarking on a, a, what hopefully is a successful and an exciting career? Now, Sabrina, you said that um, it might not be easy, but work hard, seek advice and help from other people. Yeah, I think, I think there's sort of this tendency, I was very lucky despite not going to, um, to, to culinary college, to have really amazing people around me who I could... I could ask advice for, and I think I think there's a bit of a tendency to um, for chefs to feel like they should go alone, and it's my path and it's my journey. And actually, actually, the, the playing field is so level when you reach out to chefs. We're all tired in the same way. We all face the same dramas. That's three star, two star, one star, gastro pub. Doesn't matter how and where you cook. A crisis in service is a crisis in service. Um, so, you know, I, I would just say reach out to people, ask for help and ask for advice, you know, and it is, it is the truths of people in industry um, to tell you what you may or may not face that, that can, uh, I think, help give you a little, a little direction, really. Guys, do you think social media has been a great leveller in that and that people are now much more accessible? Yeah, Anyone? definitely. People want to, people are much more accessible and people want to do a lot better as well. Same as guides and things, it creates competition and people... Well, at the end of the day, it makes people better. It makes people's food experiences better. Um, Matt, you said that the, the hospitality industry is one of the most diverse industries in the world, uh, and there are many a areas to explore. I mean, uh, you're probably better placed than anyone um, <laughs> to talk us through that. I mean, obviously, your career yeah. didn't start there, but um, you, you know, if, if you were sat in the audience now, what advice would you be given? Well, I kind of, I, first of all, I, I wish I had this kind of you know, upbringing as, as a young chef. I kind of fell into the industry very early on um, and went into restaurants. Uh, I worked with you know, some of the great chefs in, in, in the industry, Gordon Ramsay being one of them, and, and, and learning through that process. But also, you know, I'm now in an industry which is, for me, one of the most exciting industries in the world. Not only do I get to cook, but I get to travel as well. And you know, there's not many industries that you can do so many different things. Um, and and you know, going back to a lot of the comments around uh, how you how you move your career it's it's not only self driven it's also working with teams i work from teams globally through you know and we serve 800 million passengers a year that's a huge amount of people so not only that you can touch that many people through what you do so i'm now in an industry right from the very beginning where it was you know very small and and, and the, in, the hospitality industry has grown hugely over the 25 years i've been in it um, so, you know, it's exciting now to be able to go globally, which we were never doing before. Um, you know, again, the veteran, we weren't that much travelled when, we when we were kids. Uh, now everybody's getting on planes every five minutes. So, you know, some fantastic places to work and learn from. Yeah, and, uh, and that's a really interesting point. Learn, and Alex, you said that, is you've got to keep learning and you've got to challenge yourself to keep learning. So how do you do that? How do you keep learning? What's the, what's the secret to do that? I mean, yeah, like you're saying, is, and you guys, I'm sure, would agree with me at your levels, you've got to make sure you're learning every day, learning, um, you know, from the beginning of your career, you'll be learning a lot and there's a lot to take in. Um, even when you start, you know, getting up into management positions, you want to still be learning. Otherwise, you just... You got become really stale and it's, it becomes boring and that's when you don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. And it's, you, you have a responsibility to the rest of the team too, exactly, don't yeah. you? So as you progress, it's, that it's not just about you being inspired, but it's mm. what you're showing yeah. everybody and how, exactly. how they're engaging as well. Which yeah, is your, your attitude as, you know, as a head chef or sous chef will, you know, will flow into the rest of the team. You know, if you're having a bad service, it shows if you're calm and relaxed the other guys are going to be calm and relaxed definitely and it just helps out a lot but yeah as we were saying you've got to be always learning and for me i if i wasn't learning i'd say something to my head chef or manager and just say oh you know i'd like to move on to the next section or can i try this section or can i have more responsibilities to do you know just keep yourself out there pushing for new things to learn and 
it, 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 if even if you've done everything in that kitchen, then look on to your next job and you know start a new chapter, learn pastry, or you know if you're working only yeah. in the main kitchen. I th yeah, I think that's that's really important. Also, is the idea that for me now the things that I look for in people, the the ability to cook and cook well is something that you are constantly refining and mm. developing. Um, but also ask about ask about the other things, the paperwork, the business, the other sorts of things, because it's really relevant. You know, I have my degree is actually in fashion, PR, and marketing, and I only cook because it makes me happier than anything I've ever done. <laughs> Um, and nobody in fashion eats, so that's kind of a bit of a bit of a problem. <laughs> um, so that didn't that didn't really uh, was never going to work for me. But you know, it's that part where now it isn't it isn't just you know lots of restaurants open and, and the knowledge isn't there to help them succeed. So learn as much as you can. And I never thought I would say it, but that might be Excel spreadsheets. It might be some kind of computer led anything. It's costings. It's finance. It's whatever. There is always something to pick up and learn because you will never know how valuable that tiny little, you know, I actually listened in my IT class 15 years ago. And now, you know, it helps me when I'm tapping out Excel spreadsheets for, for whatever we're doing in the club. Like, it's relevant. Every, you, nothing is ever wasted in terms of knowledge. Just keep it because you'll, you'll come back to it. Tom, you said uh, find someone that inspires you. Uh, and, that, and that you want to work for. Is that what you did with Tom Kerridge? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, it's drive and passion and respect for ingredients and d drive of flavour. And the example he sets as well, that's important. You've always got to work for someone that sets a good example and, yeah, just inspires you to want to be better, want to use the best, want to work hard. Because if, at the end of the day, if you haven't got that, then, you know, you're on your own. Just to pick up on a point that you all mentioned there is that um, and, and I think Alex raised it first was you know asking um, asking your manager you know being hungry f uh, for knowledge you guys now all as managers if you have someone in your team like that how do you respond to that that person encourage it yeah ask always ask questions I ask questions everyone asks questions you, you want to be you know better than you were so do you, would you would you say that, that that person that's hungry for knowledge and hungry for success is more likely to su succeed Matt well, I think, I think I'm reading a great book at the moment, actually, and it's all about, it's called The Leader With No Name. So uh, write that one down, it's a brilliant one. But the point is, you can be a leader at whatever level you're at. So, you know, you could be a leader washing the pots. You're the backbone of the kitchen. If you're good at it, you're going to actually push the kitchen to be faster and better at what they do. So my best advice would be actually always to lead in what you do. So if you, if, whether it's in the front of house, whether it's in the bar, whether it's in the kitchen, leading from example and, and you know the, the creating that example and, and actually being able to open up to learning I'm still learning today and you know I'm 40 so I will always be learning and as long as you are always learning you're actually potentially always leading so you know the best advice I can give to anybody going into the hospitality industry or any industry is about leadership and, and understanding that your reactions, your responses have actions for other people. And that can be either negative or positive, depending on who you are. OK, so uh, next question then. Um, as, as individuals, did you set career goals? And, it, and if so, what were they? I mean, you know, we, we hear about goals and we hear about the importance of goals. Uh, I assume you all set goals. Um, Alex, you said at the beginning you didn't really have anything set, but you felt that was okay. Is that has that changed? Yeah, exactly. Um, I fell into the industry. It was never. I didn't grow up wanting to be a chef. Um, it's just I failed college. It was A levels, and then I was working in the kitchen part time. So what? What did washing. you want to be? What? What was? I don't know. I don't think I had any ambitions really. What I wanted to be. I I was stuck in a bit of a rut. I didn't know what career I wanted to go into. I really had no idea. I think I liked football at the time, so I, that's what I was really concentrated on. Um, <laughs> but as soon as I started cooking, I started getting that passion for it and that drive to, oh yeah, I want to be a chef. Um, and it's okay to not have a goal at the time. But then you slowly start making little goals, little aims. So like every goal, every kitchen, sorry, I go into, I set myself the goal of learning every section in that kitchen I did when I started becoming a younger chef. And then once you do that, you start understanding where you want to go in your life. In your career, um, like if you want to go into fine dining, if you want to 
stick at casual food or you know pastry um, then you set your long-term goals oh I want to become a executive chef or, or I want to be a head chef of a independent restaurant and that's when you start setting these goals for yourself so if you don't have goals straight away in your career it's not the end of the world you're not you know it's not going to affect it straight away Sabrina you've been setting goals since a very early age it's a Punjabi background <laughs> upbringing, I'm not going to lie to you. So obviously I've had a five-year plan since the age of eight because that's how we roll. Um, and it is part of that cultural thing where, where it is always what is it you want to do and how are you going to get there? And it's just, it's just who I am now. Um, and I think it kind of stood me in good stead, really. I mean, mu much like yourself, I, I completely came into this... Um, I always wanted to be a fashion designer, so I went to London College of Fashion, did all of that, and then when they told me I'd earn a pittance working for somebody else, I thought, oh, chefing, <laughs> that's different. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I do it because I just love it, and, um, and, and that's what it's about, isn't it? It's about mm. the love of the craft, cool. and you set yourself goals as to, when I first stepped into the kitchen, I did have my light bulb moment, and I thought, my God, why? Why was this never an option to me? I could have, you know, instead of my GCSEs, A-levels and, and degree, maybe I could have gone to, to you know, hospitality college or otherwise. Um, but nothing was wasted again, like I said. So PR and marketing was useful. Fashion, questionable at best. Um, but, you know, I think, I think it's about committing to what you want to do, enjoying it and, and working hard. And your goals will change. Yeah, I mean, you said, you said in your early career it was about salaries and now it's about work-life balance. So do, do you find that, you know, you, you, you reassess where you are and you reset goals? I think everything is constantly changing around you, isn't it? I mean, I know you're, yeah, you're yeah. about to have a, have a just, child yeah, exactly. any minute. I'm just, saying, you know, <laughs> right. goals, so. I'm just waiting on that call at so, the moment. Um, but it's really key, you know, exactly yeah. as you say. You know, you, you set your goals, but I'd first of all say, set out by saying that I never set financial goals when I was yeah. younger. And I think, you know... That's a really clear message is that, you know, it comes later. Yeah. You can wait for that. And, and, and that's not the be all and end all. And, and, and finance is not, you know, it doesn't make the world go around. Yeah. And that actually brings out the passion in you. And then you decide mm. what you really want to do. That's what then leads your career. I've never made a career decision based on finance uh, until now. But now. I've got another one coming along. So, you know, I've got a family to build. But, but your lifestyle choice should always come after your passion and, and that's really where we all have, have come from it's, it's about understanding what we really wanted to do mm. and then the bank came afterwards and, and, and that's you know that's where you'll really understand where you, where you want to be uh, Tom you uh, uh, for yourself you said you know you didn't set sort of time bank goals but what you did do is when you went into somewhere you know if you were a commie you said uh, you know I want to be a chef to party if you're a chef to party you want to be a sous chef so is that, was that something you did? You just, you just sort of said, I just want to be better, I want to be the next person? Yeah, I never really had any super long-term goals, but I was always looking at what the person above me was doing or the person next to me and wanting to just strive for responsibility, be better faster than I was the day before, than they are at the time. And then it sort of all flows. And then eventually you do get your longer-term goals, but I agree with uh, that as well about the... Uh, Sort of finance, you don't even that's never even thought about that to be honest. And then you find what you want to do, find your passion, and then everything else sort of comes. So, I guess the, the, the summary of answering that is that yes, set goals, but they don't have to be time bound, they certainly don't have to be salary related, and, it, and equally reevaluate where you are. As long as you're happy doing it, yeah. as long as you're happy in what you're doing, and th things change, you know. I just things do change, you know. I just yeah. bought. Timely, as I decided to, to enter into a career in chefing, I had just bought my apartment, which actually wouldn't pay for itself, so which <laughs> is why it was quite relevant to, um, to make the correct yeah. amount of money to cover a mortgage that I needed to have a responsibility for. So, you know, whilst, whilst the world doesn't revolve around money, you have to be mindful of your responsibilities. Um, and everything is a juggling act, really, so. Yeah, no, fantastic. Um, Today is all about inspiring the, uh, the, these wonderful people in front of us. Um, and, and of course, everybody wants to succeed. 
But was there ever a time in your career where you thought, actually, I, I haven't got this right and I need to reevaluate where I, where I am? And, and ha has that sort of ever come up? I mean, we'll go back to you, Sabrina, because, you know, it's quite an interesting response. Um, you know, you said two years ago um, you, you were virtually burnt out. Yeah, actually, and I don't think people tend to talk about it as often as, um, as they really should, actually. And, and I mean, the first opening I did of a really amazing Italian restaurant was, was superb, and it was sort of two and a half, almost three years of solid graft. And it just got to the point where you just can't keep working that, those hours for that amount of time before, you know, it was taking a physical toll. I wasn't going to the gym, I wasn't being healthy, you know. And, um, and it just got to the point where I was just exhausted, couldn't get out of bed, tired, migraines, absolute shambles. Um, and I needed a couple of months to just call time um, and reassess the way I was looking after myself, the way I was working and how I was managing my sort of work-life balance, really. So, yeah, I had a very long holiday, uh, which was needed. Got eight hours sleep for, God, the only time ever in my life, really. Um, and started thinking about how I, as a senior chef, now had the ability to change the way I worked and the way my brigades worked, which is that if this is happening to me, then it will happen to other people. Therefore, I have a responsibility to make sure that, you know, we, we don't all fall into the same, same kind of uh, routine, really. So. And Tom, I was really, really interested by your reply because, you know, you said, show me a man that's never failed. Mm. And, you know, there's, there's lots of sayings that, you know, you don't fail, it's just part of a success path. You know, so often failure is just part of the learning process, isn't it? I mean, is that how you look at it, Tom? Yeah, massively. I mean, I've made more mistakes than I haven't, and you just learn from them. I've definitely burnt more things than I haven't burnt. And then the next day, you just either burn it less or cook it better. It's, it's but fun. I think that's really important. I mean, you know, it, keep picking on uh, Mr. Kerridge. You know, we, we see him on the TV, and, and he's this huge figure now, you know, from a marketing perspective. But I think the thing is, and I hope what, what these wonderful people get today is, you're all real people like everybody else. Mm. And you all burn things, and you all cut yourselves, and you all wore blue plasters, and all of those things, right? <laughs> you all did all those things. That old chestnut. <laughs> <laughs> um, Matt, yourself, yeah. have you ever sort of thought, you know, this, this isn't for me, you've had to reevaluate? I don't, I, I don't as, 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 as you, know, you guys say, you know, I don't think there's been a day that goes by in my career where I haven't questioned what I'm doing. And I think that brings you back to challenging yourself and taking another step uh, outside of what you do every day. You know, it's an, in, it's an industry that changes every day. It's also an industry that will change you. It will change the way that you work and the way that you operate, and that's down to you. But also, you always learn by the mistakes that you make, whatever career you're doing. And, you know, uh, we were back in the Savoy together, so burning the brioche was the norm in the Savoy. So, uh, you know, but you learn and you, you, you carried on and life goes on. By making those mistakes, you get better. And, and, and you, whether it's a, a wrong career choice to in, into a restaurant or into a, a business or into something that you've actually turned around that you don't actually like it, just step away, re readjust, and, and have a look at what you really have a look at what you want to do. So you know, make mistakes, 100%. We all do it, and 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 you know, some of the best chefs in the world make mistakes. Um, some of the best businessmen in the world make mistakes. That's why they open and close. Um, so you know, it's about learning and being that sponge to absorbing all of the things around you, and then using that sponge to mop up the mess afterwards. And Alex, you're still very much sort of mid-career path, I guess, but are, are, are you sort of happy where it's going? Are you, are you re-evaluating where you are? Have you, has there been a time where you thought, oh, I don't know, this isn't for me? I mean, you, everyone will all agree, every chef gets that time in their career where you, or, you know, more of often you get that thing, oh, why am I a chef? Why am I, I don't know why I'm doing this, or it happens to everyone. So once, if it happens to you, talk to people about it it's not don't be shy to, you know be open and say oh you know i'm struggling or and it's all about having a positive mental attitude it really is you know pushing through those hard times and uh, you know there's times you do long hours and you finish work at midnight one o'clock in the morning and then you've got to be in at seven o'clock in the morning the next day you've got to get the night bus home and you know it is hard and you get home and you think oh I, you know can't be up in a few hours. Fall asleep on the way home, end yeah. up in the last spot. Oh yeah, a few times that's happened. <laughs> yeah. um, 
Yeah, so obviously there are times where it's going to be absolutely awful, really, really hard, but it's just pushing through it and, you know, you want to be a chef and, you know, it's, it will be better. You know, you have a bad day, the next day is not going to be bad, right. you know. And we all have them. Yeah. Yeah. Hashtag brioche. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I think that's the thing, then, isn't it? I guess in in summary, to, to answer that question is that you know there will there will be tough times, and you will potentially reevaluate where you are. I don't think that's exclusive to hospitality, though, no. is it? I think no, that's probably true in every single industry. Mm. Um, and it's it's like you say. I guess tomorrow's another day. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I had a pound for every banker or ex banker that I've had in a restaurant working for me then you know I'd be a millionaire and banking myself but you know people choose different career choices all the way through you know all the way through life um, but the hospitality industry is, is one of those special industries where people kind of gravitate towards it and you know we've got suppliers here we've also got chefs here but you've also got so many different attributes and, and roles within the hospitality industry whether it's finance whether it's you know catering whether it's hospitality so there's, there's so much more opportunity now than there ever has been. Yeah, no, brilliant. Um, next question then. Give us an example of when you faced a challenge in your role and how did you deal with that? Um, Alex, you mentioned that um, you, were, you were working and you lost a, uh, a, a several members of the team. You all sort of had to come together. You had to do extra time in the kitchen, extra, uh, sort of no days off. Mm. Um, talk us through that. Yeah, exactly. So I was working in the kitchen where we lost quite a substantial amount of staff at the same time. So it was working, you know, extra days, working seven days a week, it could have been. Um, and you just, it's working as a team and, you know, pushing through that. And like I said a minute ago, it's, it's about having that positive mental attitude and just knowing, oh, you know, I'm a chef and I can, I really want to be here and do this and I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And it's just, there are going to be hard times. It's just, pushing through it and you know having that great attitude of yeah it's going to get better and you know tomorrow's another day it'll be better tomorrow and if you know things will get better yeah. I think in most kitchens though there is a massive camaraderie isn't there yeah yeah you know it it, it really is kind of like a club where everyone's You're sort family of, you yeah know, you absolutely see, family you see your way. you see the kitchen stuff your team members more than you see your family yeah at the end of the day so it does become like a, a community almost yeah. doesn't it where yeah. Okay, uh, Matt, what about yourself? Uh, quite, quite, uh, quite interesting, because you, you, you're talking to a stable of three ex-Ramsey chefs <laughs> uh, from, from the generations. Um, I'm obviously Generation Z. Um, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but, you know it's, it, it really is um, a phenomenal industry to work in. I forgot the question now. <laughs> no, we, we were just talking about an exact, you know, where, where you face the challenge in your career. Um, I mean, you, you were saying that some of the biggest challenges in your career was learning different cultures. Yeah, I mean, I, I, left, I left the UK in 2005 and went to the Middle East um, with the same attitude as I had in a London restaurant. What a mistake. Um, and what a mistake to make because when you go somewhere and you shout at somebody in the same way that you used to back in the old days before human resources were invented, um, <laughs> you can't do that. And when you have a whole kitchen brigade walk out on you because of the way that you've treated somebody, something's got to change. And that, that comes from in you. And again, it's about leadership. Again, it's about learning different cultures. Um, and we are so fortunate these days to have so many different cultures under one roof in so many elements. And I now learn from that. And I have always learned from that. This was a stage in my life where I came from London. It was very normal to be around people who were in an aggressive culture of kitchens and you know back in those days it was completely the rock star chef style um, but although that's glorified the industry but it's also done a lot of bad for it and it's also from my opinion it's actually you know given us this whole thing where you really need to absorb and learn from other people and, and you know some of the best recipes that I have in my stable now are from some of the different regions that I've worked with and, and, and that's about learning from the people that you work with. So you have to kind of adjust your lifestyle and your, your temperament as well as your ability to speak to people and that makes you a better manager, it makes you a better leader, it also makes you a better team player because teams are built up of different people. So you know we've learned through loads and loads of different 
ways of, of working, but you also learn the best way of working. Sabrina, you said you were faced with a challenge where you didn't feel you were being creatively satisfied, which I think is really interesting as a chef because you know, you're all creative animals, right? That's, that's kind of what you do. So how did you resolve that? Well, I think, I, I mean, at one point, one of my posts, I felt that I had taken it as far as I could. And this comes from the bit where when we talk about changing environment, you've learned enough, you're ready to move and work with somebody else or otherwise. You know, I had, I had, I felt that I had learned everything I need to from that post, which was opening, you know, 6,000 square foot of restaurant in the middle of Marlebone. Um, the first opening I had done, um, which was an Italian restaurant, just because I love Italian food, pasta every day. Um, and then I just decided, you know, what, what else do I want to do? What else do I want to learn? And some of that progression for me has been, um, it, it's, it's creative led and it's also creative but business led for me too now in the role that I have and, and you know, your multiple kitchens, multiple sites, multiple teams, everything sort of gets bigger and more um, and the responsibilities for that grow. So, you know, it's how do I lead my team creatively? <coughs> am I cooking the food that really satisfies me? My team are learning um, and am I really happy with what I'm doing? Um, because sometimes you need to change. And Tom, you said, you know, running a business, you, you face a challenge every single day. It's, it's perhaps just a different challenge. It is really, li like you guys have said earlier, it's about PMA, you know, positive mental and, and actually just getting on with it. Yeah, every day is a challenge. Like the things that go wrong, you never even thought would go wrong. I mean, like this morning, our veg delivery didn't turn up because I spoke to you Brick last night on the phone. So I have to go <laughs> in and do the herbs. For the garnish, like things like that, you wouldn't even think would happen. But as long as you go in, smile on your face, it's, you know, it's what you want to do, isn't it? So it's your passion. So you drive on and you do it better. So I guess in summary then, there's, there's, there's always challenges in every business. It's, it's really just how you approach them. Um, it's, it's, it's being positive. It's taking them step by step. And don't be frightened to ask. Yeah. yeah? I think you've got to look at it as a challenge is an opportunity. And that is, you know, one of the biggest things in business. Uh, every challenge that you face is going to be an opportunity. So that could be an opportunity to open a door, an opportunity to make money, an opportunity to learn, and an opportunity to teach. So, you know, challenges are great. It's what we're all here for. And I guess the exciting thing as well is once it's happened to you once, the next time you go, oh, I, I know how to deal with that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Or not. Sometimes <laughs> <in the brioche. laughs> but you still kept burning the brioche, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moving, moving on to the next question then. Um, what more does the industry need to do to promote itself to be a positive career choice? I mean, you all mentioned there, you know, what, what it was like in, in you know, um, previous times, but, you, you know, the, uh, the industry is changing. It's becoming much more approachable. Um, we are seeing a shift to much more reduced hours, straight shifts, work-life balance, all of those things. But what has the industry got to do? Sabrina, I'm going to ask you as a lady, what has the industry got to do more? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I mean, currently I'm looking, Albright is a, is a women's members club that we're growing and part of the narrative that I'm now lucky enough to, uh, to celebrate and discuss is, is women returning back to work, which I know is not currently something that, that is featuring for students, but, um, but you know, if, if amazing phenomenal chefs have these just amazing careers and then they have children and then it's, well, actually I can only work two days in the week. Um, and for me, if you can only give two days a week, I'll take two days a week because you bring that knowledge, that skill uh, to my team to pass it on and to train to people. So I'm very lucky to have the flexibility to now make that part of what we do as a business um, so that we don't lose that skill and knowledge. And for me, it's so interesting. And I love hearing about the golden years of, you know, the Savoy and the Ramsey era and all this sort of stuff because, you know, I grew up watching it on television. Um, but never really lived that life actually so everything about the kitchens that I run not to say that sometimes I don't get a bit wound up um, is that people feel confident enough and and you know supported enough to come forward and have a conversation with me at any time because that's kind of what the team is about so you know I, I haven't worked in these kitchens where you get a rollicking for you know not picking something correctly or just because you know these rolls aren't trimmed properly or washed or whatever that's not, that's not the kind of kitchen that I have. So for me, I want people to know, again, women in kitchens, you know, please come and see me because there's plenty of jobs. Um, 
You know, it's it's a great, safe, vibrant environment, and that's that's kind of what we are. You know, that's what we're about, really. Alex, you said, I mean, the obvious things, hours and pay. I yeah. mean, you, you've all said don't set financial targets, but equally, everybody needs a financial, you know, responsibility. We've all got bills to pay, rent, whatever. So, you, you know, but do you think now salaries are getting better in relation to hours people are working? Yeah, I mean, from 10 years ago when I started cooking, I think the salaries have got so much better. You know, you now get paid for, you know, a minimum wage for, you know, above minimum wage now. You know, you can't get paid under minimum wage anymore. Um, when I first, first started cooking, yeah, I think I worked out what my first job that I was getting paid, I think three pounds an hour or something like that for the hours I was doing. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> as much as that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it? yeah. So That's it's, true. I mean, yeah, the industry is getting rid of that stigma of, you know, it's awful pay and, you know, you do ridiculous hours. There's so many, um, you know, restaurants and hotels out there that are doing four day working weeks now, but it's just, makes it a lot more social and it's just the industry needs to promote that more and you know show that it's not like that anymore you know I've seen Michelin star kitchens but there's no not a single swear word being you know said throughout the day and they run you know perfectly the kitchen there's no stress it's like just a you know a great environment to work in it just it doesn't need to be like that anymore like you know like the old rock star you know up in London you know, chefs are crazy and all that, but you know, you know, it, it's not like that anymore. Yeah. You don't need to be like that. Yeah. Tom, you mentioned about you know more aware, uh, more awareness, uh, own, open days. Um, I guess th this audience here have chosen to be chefs because they're all sat there and chef wise. Do you think we need to get into schools more and things like that? 100%. Then I think things like this are amazing. Where you can get to speak to people and you hear that they make mistakes. They don't just you know, cook everything perfectly all the time. They burn stuff. They forget to do things. That's something we're doing at the moment, we're doing a couple of open days, so people that are looking to join the industry, join our, our group, um, get a tour around, get to meet all the chefs, people they could be working with or for, and I think it's important to integrate people and show it's a welcoming, I mean it's hospitality isn't it, everyone's nice and polite, it's not a us versus, you know, back of house versus front of house anymore, everyone's a team, and yeah, definitely like things like this, open days, just pull more people in. And Matt, very interesting. You kind of looked at it from a business percentage, and uh, you know the cost of staff turnover. Yeah. So you're sort of saying it's it's about investing in people. Exactly. I think I think you know, let's be really real. The restaurants are businesses, yeah. and at the end of the day, um, rents are high in London. Rents are high, you know, even outside London now. Um, so so you're working in a business that has to make money, but also. You have to invest in that business in the right way, and investing in people is the biggest thing that the hospitality industry has never done and really needs to start doing. You know, investing in our people is very key. And, and what does that investment mean? Well, health and well-being is really key. Mental awareness is a huge thing right now, um, but it needs to be bigger and it needs to be stronger. We're in an industry where we work long hours, we work with big teams, we work in a high profile environment, we're working a long time on, on your feet. So there are things that we can do as businesses to invest back into our people. And not only that, it's about creating opportunities and investing in those opportunities. You know, I've been fortunate enough in my career to be able to travel and to do different things, to absorb different behaviours and different, uh, you know, cultures. But not everybody has that. And as businesses, if we want to succeed, we need to invest in that. And investing in people and training and leadership and, and programs where you know apprenticeship schemes become more and more uh, you know, prevalent to what we do but actually it shouldn't be stopping right there it should be carrying on through the businesses themselves and continual learning as we've all said here today you know that's where your investment is best made because high staff turnover is one of the biggest problems in our industry um, you know and we go back to our years of, of being in restaurants, sustaining long, long hours, working extremely hard, and you know, in any industry you're going to get that, but actually putting back into that and making sure that you can maintain and keep your staff. Keeping staff is the highest 
and best investment that any business can make because when you have good retention, you have a happy team, you have a team that wants to be there, you also then don't spend the money continually recruiting and driving campaigns to get people in through your door. So investing in people is the biggest thing that our hospitality industry can do to get better. Brilliant. So I guess in summary then, the industry is definitely changing. Um, we're looking after people, we're more aware of things such as mental health, uh, well-being, we, get, we are beginning to get a work-life balance, pay is getting better, hours is getting better, so it's a really exciting opportunity, I guess. Huge. Huge. Fantastic. Okay, last question for you then, panel. Um, we've all been talking about amazing careers that you guys have had. Um, what can this audience expect from a career in hospitality, and if you can give <coughs> an example. I'm going to start with you, Matt, because uh, uh, I loved your answer. Because I'm the oldest. Uh, sorry, not Matt. Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> my apologies. Tom. Tom, I was reading that wrong. Tom, you I'm said work honest. hard, highly rewarding. I've been to Hong Kong, New York, and Manchester. Oh, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, uh, you know, uh, you, you've all travelled. It, it, is, it is a great... Cause just give us some examples, Tom, of... of I mean, great things nice that you've done. Travelling, you know, being asked to go away to cook at events in New York and Hong Kong and Manchester. Um, no, all, all <laughs> Hello, <great>. Manchester, <laughs> if you're watching. <laughs> all great opportunities, just do something so different. So what were you doing in Hong Kong? Uh, we did, oh, loads of bits, we did a taste of Hong Kong, um, a private dinner on the 40th story of a bank, and then we did four canapé parties, and it was all with other chefs, so you get to, you know, such a tight industry as well, such a small world. Um, so how long were you out there? Uh, eight days. So eight days of long days cooking, but then a lot of fun at night, and Hong Kong never sleeps. So you're out partying, yeah. you're enjoying yourself, you're making friends, and in a day you're working hard and making things nice. And then, because it's such a, all the rewards are instant as well. You know, obviously long term if you work hard, but you know, you see if someone has a nice time or enjoys their dinner, which makes it you know, great. Obviously you just do so sometimes if they don't enjoy it, but. No, no, I think it's a great, I think it's a great example. Sabrina, you said basically, you know, whatever you put in, you can take out. Yeah, I think so. I, I just think, I think sometimes it really is that simple. If you come to work and you're like, can't be bothered, can't be there, then you're never going to take anything out of your, of your career. But also that being, there's something really special about being a chef and it opens sometimes literally doors that, that otherwise would remain shut to people. And I know it's now become really the norm for for people to visit kitchens and, and meet and engage, but it is the travel element. And I remember after the, after the first Rue scholarship that I did, I went to Paris for a long weekend to celebrate and booked a, um, a, a brasserie called Benoit. And I, I was, the cassoulet is just mega, isn't it? Yeah, cassoulet for two, for one, not embarrassed at all. Um, and when they found out that I was a chef and I'd done the Rue scholarship, you know, they, they made such an effort, you know, and I, I mean, I didn't win the competition. I had just competed in it. And they, you know, they welcomed me with the kind of warmth that comes from, from chefs valuing and respecting other people in the culinary arts, which was really special for me. And I think anywhere you go in the world, um, a chef respects and values a chef and you become part of something that's, that's pretty magical, really. And Alex, for you, it's... Um there's a huge industry out there, there's, a, there's an amazing opportunity, but for you it's about working hard. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's similar to what you guys have been saying. It's, you know, the harder you work, the, it's the more reward you get from it. Um, yeah, you get some amazing experiences. You meet some incredible people. And like we were saying, it, and I, you said, it is a big industry, but when you become, you know, higher up and you, you've been in it for longer, it's not. It's such a small, tight-knit industry and, you know, <laughs> We all know each other, you know, I haven't seen you for years and, you know, we used to work with each other, <laughs> with each other um, you know, years ago. So it is, it's like having a family you never had, you know. Um, you know, you are a family at the end of the day and it's such a small industry, really. Um, and it's just, it is fantastic once you get in it. Yeah. And Matt, I'll purposely come to you last. <coughs> um, obviously what you're doing now and what you started doing very very different in terms of scale um, but i think you know you have gone from the the sort of gordon ramsay uh, small restaurant to you know global brand um, i think probably it really highlights the opportunity within hospitality Huge. i mean if i just look at my career you know on on paper 
Yeah, I, th I think there's probably about 19 We haven't got time roles, to ask you how many countries so, you know, you've been to. A few years, <laughs> but uh, you know, I've been to most countries in the world, which is amazing. Absolutely, um, yeah. I've had an ability to, to be able to learn different things. I've gone into different roles um, because of the progression, but that wasn't just me, that was what the industry can offer, and that's really exciting. Uh, and it is a small world. We do know each other, and Absolutely, you know yeah. we're a very tight knit community. But within that tight community, there are chefs that I've worked with through my 40 years of, of, of age, being in the industry for 20 years. There's there's head chefs now that I know in New York and, and Spain and, and Barcelona, Italy, all the way through to India and Goa and Japan. So you know the world's your oyster and it really does create that opportunity for you to go wherever you want to go, however you want to do it and, and, and be who you want to be. And that's, you know, again, something which not a lot of industries have. And I'm, I'm being who I'm going to be every year. And, and every time that changes, I'm still me and I'm still doing me. And that's really quite important to, to do you and do you well. And that, that <coughs> can be done anywhere. Brilliant. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> I really hope from that short sort of um, discussion that you guys have understood that these are just normal people like everybody else in this room. They've got the same worries, concerns. Um, you know, when they, when they were at college, they didn't know one end of a knife from the other. As I said earlier, they cut themselves. They did all of those things. But hard work has taken them to where they are today. Uh, and I hope they've given you an insight into what a great career choice hospitality can be. It won't always be easy, but no job is, right? It, but it's, it's about hard work, but the opportunities are definitely out there. All of these guys have you know, traveled the world. Um, I'm gonna come into the audience for a quick Q&A, but very quickly, put your hands together for the panel. <laughs> Who wants to start with a question? Don't be shy. Yes, sir. So, if you can do me a massive favour, you'll need to stand up so the cameras can get you. If you can introduce <laughs> yourself to the panel, I'll, I'll pass the microphone over, stay there. If you can introduce yourself to the panel, then ask the question. Hi, I'm uh, Andy Smith, a chef lecturer. Uh, it was uh, a question to Matt, your many millions of meals that you, uh, you design and, uh, and treat us flyers with. I didn't know how uh, the, the changing scene with um, diets and demands fitted in with that. Do you design the menus without gluten, without soy, or, or so, is it yeah. different specific things? Uh, I mean, well, the, the industry is a, is a challenge. Uh, we have huge, huge numbers of resources. You know, my chefs in my regions all design menus which not only incorporate several different allergens etc etc but it's, it's, it's slightly more than that we we have changed over you know the the airline industry is a very old-fashioned industry but we've changed an awful lot of the way that we work and you know we have you know we have so much technology to hand now we know what is in every single ingredient we utilize we design menus to actually encompass as many different allergen you know as possible. Not only that, we, we talked about trends. Um, you know, creating a trend in a restaurant is great. But when you're feeding 800 million passengers every year, you can actually kind of understand how, from a sustainability approach, that actually drives down quite a big problem. So our focus is not only on, on allergens, but it's also on creating an additional item on the menu. So, you know, we're talking about plant-based proteins. We use an awful lot of those in the, in the industry today, probably more than any other industry uh, in, in restaurants. We're actually leading that and we're working on, on those things with the industry itself to, to develop allergen-free meals. Um, and it doesn't mean that you know, somebody who can't eat something uh, has to stay away from it, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's an exciting challenge and it's something which we should all be aware of. Uh, because it's an extremely dangerous world that we live <coughs> in today. Yeah. <coughs> this, this gentleman's going to get the first mug, so who else wants to ask a question? Yes, I'll come over to you. I'm going to get over there. <laughs> Just talk amongst yourselves. 
Sorry, guys. I should have gone the road behind, shouldn't I? Sorry, I didn't plan that very well. My logistical planning wasn't so good on that one. Sorry about that. Okay, so same routine. If you can just introduce yourself to the panel, then ask them the question. Hi, my name is Natalia. I have a question for each of you. A quick advice for those students for the first trial shift, first interview. First trial shift, first interview advice. Yeah. Um, don't, don't be late. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. Um, <coughs> so I remember actually setting off about three hours early and then loitering in a cafe around the corner because I was just so desperate to not be late for it. Um, so that's always the first one. And, and I know it sounds a bit odd for me, but just, just relax, you know, just relax and don't rush it. Just enjoy the fact that you're sat there talking to whoever it is and that you've got that opportunity. Um, and in, enjoy the fact that you are, you are there for an opportunity and the beginning of something. And even if it doesn't pan out, You've got to enjoy the fact that you went there because that took guts in the first place, um, and that it's it could be the start of something. So, but don't be late ever, please. Yeah. I'd say uh, make sure you're you know well presented, clean, um, exactly. Make sure you're nice and nice and sharp. Um, but also, when you're there on your trial, ask as many questions as you can, as you you know as you possibly can. It's not going to make you look bad at all. Asking the questions makes you look like you're really interested and you want that job. So, yeah, I mean, ask questions, taste things as well. You might not have that opportunity to taste their food, you know, you're, yeah. you're getting free food at the end of the day. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> no. well, not off the pass, not off the service <laughs> tray. With a spoon oh, as well. Brilliant. Tom, what, what about for yourselves? Yes, uh, yeah, similar to Alex, it's, um, well presented, sharp knives, ask lots of questions, cling film things very nicely. Make sure you do that. Have a sharp, brand new Sharpie, brand new Biro. Yeah. <laughs> and Matt? These guys are really harsh. I'd be like, well, just do you. And, and, you know, the thing is, nobody expects you to walk into a restaurant being the next Michelin star chef. Nobody expects you to walk in there knowing everything. In fact, I'd rather you didn't know it so that I could teach it you, and therefore you would learn better, and you'd learn under me, and, you know, the, the opportunity then is yours. But take the opportunity, first of all, to, to be honest. Nobody expects you to be you know, three-star chef straight away. Uh, when you go into an interview, be, be honest with yourself and with the person that you're having that interview with. That is a brilliant question. Well done. Um, anyone else for a question? Yes. Oh, sorry. That, that's easier. <coughs> I will come to you, and then you, you'll be my last question, OK? OK, again, if you just introduce yourself to the panel, then ask the question. Hi, my name is Kafera, and I just wanted to say, um, what chef inspired you to become a chef? Who inspired you to become a chef? That's a really good question, isn't it? Well, for me, uh, I think it was Paul Bocuse. Um, I've, I've worked, you know, I, I learned an awful lot by just l watching the competitions um, and, and understanding that, you know, this is a great industry. Paul Bocuse was one of the most amazing chefs in the world. Not only was he a great chef, but he was also a great teacher and mentor. He created something called the Bocuse Door, and hopefully you've all heard of that. And watching that as a young chef, it really opened my eyes up to the amazing talent that we have in the world, but also made me go, well, I'd like to be like that. I'd like to do that. And that was, you know, for me, a massive inspiration on what started my career. I think you take inspiration from a lot, well, certainly from reading a lot of books and a lot of different chefs' books, you take their strengths. I mean, I saw there's a Kitchen Confidential and White Heat that everyone mm. always goes on about, but there's, you know, there's loads of other books and just a little bit of inspiration from here and there is always build your character and you know, widens your depth of knowledge. Yeah, um, one of my first jobs was up in London at the Savoy working for Gordon Ramsay and it was, he, was my inspiration when I started working from you. You know, you see what he's achieved and how far he's come. Um, yeah, you, you look at it and you think, wow, that's amazing. I, you know, I'd love to be able to get there at one point in my career. So, yeah. you know, them inspirational figures are, are definitely what you need to look up to people. You know, even your, it could be your sous chef, your head chef, you look up and you think, wow, they, you know, they, what they've achieved in their career, what they're doing at the moment, the food they're producing, you look at it and go, oh, that's really, really cool food. I want to, you know, I wish I could be like that one day. You have to have someone to look up to all the time. Who inspired you, Sabrina? 
Do you know, I, I mean, I grew up reading all the books and watching TV and it was, it was Rick Stein. It was, for me, it was the connect between cooking <coughs> amazing seafood locally and then he did a show called Food Heroes where he traveled the country and it was the kind of first connect between produce, supply and how important that is when you get in into the kitchen, really. So, I mean, what a guy. Um, big fan. Brilliant question. Thank you for that. Okay, what time for one more question, sir? I'm going to come down to you. There will be, these guys will be staying around, so if you've got some other questions, you can ask them. If, I'll pass you up the microphone. If you can stand up so the cameras can pick you up. And again, Hello, I'm, I'm Ben from Farnborough. And my question is, as a young chef, is it better to stay local to where you are or to branch out and when to branch out? So travel-wise and going to London and things like that, when's the best way to wow, do that? Wow, that's a really yes, good question, that's isn't that's it? That's a good question. Um, I, personally, it, it, it's down to you. Um, I left home at 17 uh, and went to London with a backpack. Um, very young, very fresh. I actually, you know, fell into the industry. It was a scary time. London's a very lonely place when you're on your own, and uh, for for me that was a real challenge. But you know, it's it's, it's down to what you you want from your career. Um, so ultimately, it's, it's almost an unanswerable question because it's mm. a very individual thing. Um, but the, don't be afraid to make a choice for the right reason. And yeah. you know, I think that's if you go to the right place you'll automatically know whether you're leaving home or whether you're going to stick at home and work somewhere local. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, that's... I think maybe this is the, the, the stages thing that we all talked about too, is that, uh, you know, perhaps at this point, because of, you know, maybe financial constraints or otherwise and living at home and whatnot, find someone locally that you are, you know, you're happy to learn from and that you think you're always learning so really and and much of this is you're learning what you don't want to do also as much as what you do want to do and how you want to work so i guess i guess it isn't necessarily just about bravery it's about you being comfortable in where you're learning and what skills you might choose to collect before you take the next step which might be moving to a big city and and working for a bigger restaurant or a bigger group so I think, I think when you're comfortable and confident to make those moves, then that's when you should, should be moving. Yeah, I agree. Um, I moved to London when I was you know, similar sort of age, 19 years old I was when I moved to London. And it, it, that's what you know, makes you into more of an adult, moving out of home and you, know, you have to do your own washing and you've got to go out and cook <laughs> food for yourself. You know what I mean? That, that sort of thing is not, it's not just the cooking and working in the restaurant. When you move out and move, expand out, um, yeah, you, you learn a lot more life skills as well. So, and that you take that into your kitchen where you're working as well, and it help you, you know, with confidence and uh, you know build you up into a better chef. It does. I'm so sorry. I have to run, uh, literally off the stage. Thank you. <laughs> it was such a joy to yeah, to be on the panel with you all. Before Sabrina runs off, a massive round of applause for the panel. <laughs> So okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Firstly, I want to say a massive thank you to yes. Sean and all the team here at Farnborough College. Your hospitality and your organisation today has blown us away from the signs to everything. So um, thank you so, so much. To you wonderful people, thank you very, very much. To Sabrina, to Matt, to Tom, to Alex, massive round of applause, please. Okay, our next um, tour is going to be at Milton Keynes College, um, and now we are going to do the competition prize. So everybody had a raffle ticket, yeah? So I will oh, get, I get anyone want to... Get one. <laughs> so the prizes were a book by Nathan Angle. <laughs> right. You've got a day in the kitchen and a world-famous staff canteen mug. Who wants to pull one out? Go on, Tom. One eight three. Pink one eight three.
Good work, Rich Kitchen. <laughs> Um, this is very good. Sean, this is for you, from all of us. 